All right, we are live. Welcome back again. Had a pretty good week. Got a lot done. Hopefully, some of the things that we got done were to the furtherance of the Lord's work. <laughs> When I put it in context like that, it doesn't seem like I got quite as much done. <laughs> but uh, we uh, we keep trying. We onward and upward. Um, what did we discuss in the previous lesson? Sands chapter and verse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, David. David's cries for mercy. Um, forever, whatever you want to say about David, David was humble, and he never, he never forgot. He never forgot who gave him what he had, and who could eat just as easily take it away. Um, and and from from whence his help came, and from whence his trouble came, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Sister Donna. Larry. He found that he could sleep well because David was a good man. Yep. Uh, the, the, the peace that he received at the, uh, specifically, I think we talked, uh, we, we said um, uh, verse, uh, verse 3, where he says, uh, the Lord will hear when I call him. The, the confidence of that statement always for for any christian for any person that serves god will result in in the peace and safety that you find at the end of the chapter in verse 8 one always precedes the other um you must um if if you have the confidence that you have the ear of god you have the confidence that no matter what lays about you that you can sleep of a night uh, now, I think you see s- stuff like that throughout the Scripture. I don't know if you necessarily would have considered Peter faithful at the moment, but he slept with all his guards about him. Uh, you had um, um, Daniel. He spent the night in the lion's den and did not seem to suffer ill effects from it. Uh, we uh, the knowing knowing that the aid of the Lord is at your is is at your call that He will hear when you call it, it and we did talk about what it costs to have that type of relationship. It, it, it's not it's not a it's not a free one sided thing. The, the Lord you say jump and God says how high. Um, it is definitely uh, a definitely a work in progress. For us, his his side of the job is already done. He he, it, it's a contract for uh, with which that he fulfills all his go- obligations at all times. It's us that sort of default on our payments, <laughs> uh, so to speak. And I'm not and I'm not talking about the contract of your salvation. There's no way to pay that up for anybody that's listening or maybe misunderstood my statement there. But the living right, the the benefits of serving God. That's just that's contractual, and it goes all the way back to the very start of the book. You live right, you have benefits in favor with the Lord. You live, you live poorly. There's also things that follow that, and, but specifically for the person of God, a lost person, yes, they they live with their the consequences of their actions, but only on a very physical level. Every, the, where they're headed is where they're always we're going to he- be headed simple fact. And that brings us to chapter 5, and we talked about 
in the last lesson about calling on the Lord. I think chapter 5 gives us some ideas about prayer. We've talked about prayer in this classroom. Uh, I believe we went through the model prayer um, about two or three years ago and talked about it as an example of the perfect prayer. There's many examples of different types of prayers in the Bible. You can look at uh, Jesus' time in Gethsemane as a time of very fervent prayer. Um, you can uh, you can look at uh, many times, uh, like uh, Brother Junior was stating just a few minutes ago, uh, where where David calls on the Lord. There there those are throughout the Psalms, and I'm sure uh, places that we're going to uh, come to eventually. Um, uh, but David gives some insight about his conversations with with the Lord. Chapter five, verse one says, "Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider." My meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for I for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Verses one through three outline three different types of communing with God. The first is with your words. I think this type of prayer is where we we attempt to approach God most often. Um, we uh, again we have the model prayer, and uh, I think we talked uh, about it um, when we talked about it. We basically came down to it that there's only what was it seven or eight words in the entirety of the model prayer that addresses physical needs. That most of the model prayer that Jesus gave us in the New Testament was uplifting to God and praying for our spiritual condition. There was, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You have a lot of praise to God in the early part. Then you have give us this day our daily bread, which is please satisfy the needs of our flesh, that the needs of our flesh for today. And then it talks about lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then closes, for thine is the king, whatever your will is. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so, in the model prayer, there's not a lot about asking for stuff that we need. Now, we've talked about asking stuff for stuff that we need a lot in this class. It is a necessary part of prayer. God enjoys us asking him for... Um, for the things that he knows that we need. Why? It's, it's the same reason that you, and I've made this, this analogy before, it's the same reason that parents like their kids to ask. You know that your kids are hungry, they need to they need to eat and to drink, and if, if you're within smell shot of them, if they need their diapers changed. You're, you're, you're fully aware of their needs. But it's always intimate when they ask you for something, when they use their words to come to you with a request. Uh, God is the very same way. In fact, our prayers are referred to as a sweet savor to Him. He enjoys the 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 incense, if you will, of our prayers. And so, the very first part of verse one is that very basic level of our Father which art in heaven. How be and I think that that's where we often approach God. That's the vector from which that we come to Him most often. But it's not the only way. Verse the, the, the latter half of verse 1 says, O Lord, consider my meditation. Now, meditation has, I think, a very poor connotation in the modern era, in the modern era for Christians because meditation is specifically uh, tied to um, Buddhism and a lot of, a lot of foreign uh, uh, and, and uh, ungodly religions that basically... Um, Seek to to for you to clear your mind, basically to center to center yourself on yourself. Uh, they're very inward looking, and or if they're not very inward looking, they're they're doing basically what that parable in the New Testament talks about, and that's sweeping sweeping the the room clean. And once you get everything cleaned out, seven more worse than the last are going to come fill fill the spot. Uh, so um, it's not that type of meditation. I, I, when I was when I was looking at this, I had there were several references and a couple of different commentaries that I had to uh, I think it's Romans chapter eight verse twenty six that talks about the groanings, 
the groanings that cannot be uttered. We don't give time, I think, in our prayer life to the groanings, things that your physical mind and your physical tongue cannot put into words. Why? Because they're beyond you. Your spirit, which your flesh does not understand, and God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, are making a connection. And that connection is uh, will will it may it may come out in emotion and, and uh, Rev, uh, uh, Romans literally refers to it as groaning. It, it may come out and, and as 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 an emotional influx. Your 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 physical body will have a reaction, but there are no words for those. And I hate to put this light this thing on it, but those feelings. There's no words for for that. Uh, describing salvation, the, the mo- describing the moment of salvation to someone, if you ever tried to do that, it's impossible to do. You can't describe it because it's something that happens inside of you and your flesh, which is still dead, doesn't understand it. <laughs> One day you'll be able to describe it. In fact, you'll probably end up singing about it quite a bit. Um, but right now in our flesh, we don't know how to do that. But we don't give ourselves in our prayer time enough time to meditate, to allow this spirit you don't have to ask him for something to pray you don't have to be asking for things to pray you don't have to necessarily be being uplifting you just need to spend time with the lord and 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 if we're going to liken this to a physical relation you know sometimes me and 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 my wife We'll sit down on the couch with one another, and we're in our own little worlds. We're doing our we're, we're doing our own thing, but the time we don't have to say nothing to each other. But the time spent together is valuable. It's actually sometimes more valuable than if we just spent in long conversation with one another. Why? Because you're 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 there, there's 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 a connection there. There's there's an there's an emotional tether. And that tether that we have with God, we don't tug on it often enough. It's is it's is and because of these three things that David outlines here, it's just as important as the rest. And so often we lean on trying to vocalize how we're feeling, vocalize uh, what we're trying to say, and, and I think a lot of that comes in from. Um, you know the the, uh, the 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 type of prayer that we're taught as children uh, to prayer to to pray. We just don't give ourselves this time. But it, it, it it's it's in, it's in, it's it's incredibly refreshing a time spent just at peace and at communion with the Lord. And I'm not talking about omen and doing all kinds of mumbo and jump mumbo jumbo but i actually think meditation is what the prayer closet is specifically for yes you can spend time talking but it's hard to re- reach this meditation this groaning if you will as the new new testament refers to it if you've got a lot of chaos going on around you it it, it you know it's just like the the when i told said about me and my wife sitting down if we have company over we can't achieve that now i can look over at my wife and probably tell tell you exactly what she's thinking but you can't achieve that close just silent communing with one another when there's a bunch of people around. I think meditation is is what the prayer closet is designed for. It you're going to get all of your uh focus away from the world and in on God. There is uh was it uh the that church that produces all those like Christian motivational movies. Um uh Sherwood uh uh, yeah, Sher- the Sherwood Baptist Church. And they've got some good movies, but they did one on prayer, prayer warriors or something. I, for- I forget what it was called. Anyway, it, it unimportant, but it actually showed in that movie this woman that she set up a prayer closet for herself. She didn't get it at first, and then when she finally did get it, God started answering her prayers, blah, blah, blah. But it showed the, the family together using the prayer closet, and that's not what it was designed for. The, the prayer closet is not communal. 
the prayer closet is not even necessarily, at least to my belief, a place where you vocalize. Prayer, prayer closet is for, for, for you to commune with God. What do the Catholics use their special confessionals for? It's you, which, it's you basically conversing with their God, their Father. <laughs> and I'm not talking about our Father. I'm talking about the Father that works at that particular uh, assembly. Uh, that's what they use their confessionals for. They talk through that screen, uh, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Uh, and, and that's what they they, that's what they use that and it, but in a very similar fashion that's what our personal prayer closet is for we're supposed to go in there by ourselves and commune with our father as if he's sitting right there just beyond the, the view of our the, the the periphery of our view and that's what that is that is the meditation we we, we we've, we've we've got to We've got to try to stop sometimes, and, and our brains work not. I know mine does it where it's not to nothing, and and you and you want to move from this thing to the next thing, but you really have to slow down and focus and take all the t- and not worry about what's happened on outside. Just center in and do this meditation. Super important, and I think super integral to a to a great relationship with the Lord. Uh, verse two says, "Hearken unto the voice of my cry." My King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Now, in verse two, at the first, so it says the third type I think of prayer, and one that I think we do get to from time to time, but not often, is the crying. This is when you're pleading for help. This is when you are when when things are going not your way, and you're in a, you're in need of aid. Now. It says, it says, hearken unto the voice of my cry, and then how does David refer to God? He doesn't refer to him as Lord. He refers to him as, as my king. Now, crying is an emotion that from the very earliest of ages we understand um, it is an involuntary uh, reaction. I mean, for most time, for babies, if, if they're crying... Most of the time, there's I've I've had some experience, but most of the time it's because there's something wrong with them. They're hungry. They're they're, they're they need their they're they're wet. They need their diaper change. They're sleepy. They're just fussy. They don't want to go. They don't want to get down to a good level of sleep. Something's wrong with them, or they're just being depraved and they just want to make you pick them up and hold them, uh, which is also a need, but probably not exactly worth crying over. Uh, it was something that we learn the further we go up. But this type of cry. That David's referring to, I don't know that it necessarily is coincides with that type of cry or the type of cry where like, oh, everything's going awful. That type of cry. I don't think it is. Because how does he address God? My king. Now we've talked about feudalism in this class before. We've talked about uh, vassals and lords and how they all owed fealty to what? The king. To get a request from the king was a, was a difficult thing to achieve. This is David not only acknowledging I have a problem, and in medieval times, people would come to their kings with their problems, but this is also David real, uh, placing himself where he feels that his that he's at. He's a subservient role. I am at the very least a a a vassal to to my king to my God. I am I am taking you I am putting you up on the highest pedestal that our political system would you know the politi- political system of the time would allow and saying that I am the lowest on the totem pole remember what Paul Paul said that he was the chiefest of sinners it, 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 taking taking Christ and putting him up on the highest shelf and taking you and putting you on the lower shelf that is what saying my king meant and this cry was I'm going to come to you with my request and I'm going to plead my case before you and like brother junior was saying about David's cries for mercy I'm going to throw myself at the good graces and mercies of my king knowing that kings are not required to do anything for their subjects but a good king now this this is this is the thing about this thing about feudalism a good king will a good king will because if and this doesn't happen to Christ but in medieval times if you were not a good king the people would revolt against you there was a quid pro quo you were the king because the people empowered you to be so so a good king 
Jesus, the good king, hears the cries of his servants. When you come before him and you literally cast yourself as nothing before him and all the power is at his disposal as it truly is, well, things start happening. A good king will rise up and say, I will not stand for this injustice. You are, you are my subject, you are my servant, and that Lord will not treat you that way. The devil will not treat you that way. I will stand up, I will beat him down, I will decree an order, and it shall be done. And that's the that's a place that we can operate at. I think specifically the cry links really closely back to the to the comments of chapter four about getting back in that when when I cry, the Lord will hear my call. But you have to be able to get into the throne room, people. <laughs> You, 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 if you know, you know, you know what vassals and servants didn't make it into medieval courts. Probably the ones in prisons, probably the ones that were wandering off in another country. Why? Because they couldn't get it there. It doesn't. It didn't matter if you were under the sub the subjugation of this king when you're in another king's country. It doesn't matter. You have no rights here. And so often we wander in another king's country. We got we we wander our way down to Egypt and subjugate ourselves to pharaohs. when we could just throw ourselves at the mercy of a of a infinitely merciful and gracious God who actually holds power to do actual things that affect our actual lives. But what do we do? It's a simple fact, but there's there, there, with, with, with that, without faith, without action, there is no... Because again... All of this stuff, and I think I think we're kind of coming back to this again. This is all on you. This isn't on God. This is this these type of relationships, these types of prayers, this type of faith is not on Him. He has the power. He holds the key. He will do it if you ask. He's promised it multiple times in His Word. It's on us. We don't have any power, and you know the only one I can blame for not having any power, us. You want to see you you want to see a move of God. You you want you you want to you want to see you want to see uh, even things in your localized area, the things that touch just your life, not not even your family, just your life specifically. You want to see those things change. You got to do something. You got to make an effort. You gotta you you gotta you gotta live in righteousness. I think as chapter three says, you you've got you've got to call upon the Lord as chapter four says, and you've got to meditate. As chapter 5 says, you've got to put the work in. You want to have a good relationship with God? Have a good relationship with God. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, and, and, it's, and, and it's not difficult to understand. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Now David indicates a time of prayer. Now we know based on Daniel's uh, prophet, uh, the 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 book of Daniel and, and his and uh, his prophecy there uh, that Daniel was very good about praying in the morning and the evening every day. In fact, it, he was so consistent that it got him into trouble eventually. Um, but David indicates a morning prayer again. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you when to pray. I feel like I feel like our um, dispensation, the dispensation of grace, is a lot more loose on the rules of. You know when to pray. If we decided all to meet on Monday, I don't. I think we should meet on the Lord Day. But if we all decided just to start meeting on Monday, I don't know that it would necessarily make make that much of a difference. But this and prayer is the same way. I can't tell you. Oh, now you need to you need to pray three times a day and wash your hands after you do it. That those type of rules are out the window in our age. But I will say that we have two examples with with. Uh, um, with uh, Daniel and with uh, and with David here, and, and I'm sure if I could dig around in my brain a little bit more, I could come up with some more of a morning prayer, a morning oblation before the Lord, a, a starting your day by communicating with Him. When you wake up of a morning, you roll over and you see a significant other. Do you just roll back over to the other side? And just go. Do you say good morning? Well, he's there with you all the time. 
every day. And when you come out of your stupor of unconsciousness, maybe he'd like to hear a good morning too. Now that does sound petty, but honestly, the Bible refers to God as a jealous God. <laughs> I'm not saying that our God is petty. I'm saying that he wants as much attention as everybody else is getting. More so. He said, I created you. The person laying next to you just married you. They put up with you. I saved you. I deserve as much as everybody else. And that's why, you know, that's why I think that our, our church building should be as nice as our houses. Uh, you know, our, 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 uh, the, way that, the way that we dress to come should be as nice or nicer than we show up to do anything else. This should be the place where we put our best foot forward. Why? Because God deserves it. He deserves the best of us, and when you wake up of a morning, maybe it's time to sit down and pray. That's just a and and, he, and moreover said, "My voice shalt thou hear." Now David had these quiet, intimate moments, and I think what we can see from the last several psalms that we've looked, God heard him when he spoke, and that's invaluable. Uh, I will direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. For thou art a God. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Now he goes from this talk about prayer to what will not stand before him. Now these personal relationships, this really intimate relationship with God, is not achievable by the people that he's talking about here. What does he what, what does he say in, ver, in, in uh, verse four? For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness; neither shall evil dwell with thee. This I think is is a close. Uh, a mirror to, you know, you cannot serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and you'll serve the other, you'll love the one and you'll serve the other. You cannot uh, serve God and mammon. You just can't do it. You cannot be, you cannot hold on to the, uh, the world's coattails and try to uh, hold God's hand at the same time. It's just not going to work. Um, it says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Uh so not only will he not stand for just general evil people, just the simple work. I feel like the workers of iniquity are different from the evil. I feel like the evil are probably people that are reprobate, that can't, that that not only God won't dwell with, he can't dwell with. Physi he, by his own set law, he cannot dwell with them. He cannot interact with them. Now, I feel like, Verse 5, though, is in, indicating a whole different category. You, Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Let me tell you something, church. You can work iniquity. And God says, and, and I always like to set up whenever you see very, very strong language out of the Scripture about a particular emotion from God. God says he hates it. Not that he gets upset by it, not that he's a little angry. It's going to take him a minute to get over this one. He hates it. There's only a handful of things God said that he has hated. He considers Sodom an abomination. He, cons he hated Esau. And here he says he hates the workers of iniquity. Those strong, visceral emotions from our God are to be well heated. And you know what? We can participate in it. Unlike verse 4, we can be part of verse 5. We can be foolish, and we can go down our own path, and we can commit iniquity just as easily as a lost person. Why? Because we still have to contend with this, but it, we're supposed to be better. And God can't contend with it. You want to have that personal relationship with God? You can't be involved in this. You, you can't be wrapped up in your sin all the time. I think that's why probably David thought he was A-OK -okay after he murdered uh, Bathsheba's husband because God wasn't within a thousand miles of him. And he thought, everything must be fine because I haven't felt the uh, the pricking uh, of, 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 of God upon my heart. And the problem was God just went in a thousand miles. In fact, he was so far away that Nathan had to say, thou art the man. I'm not necessarily so against poignant preaching because sometimes we need a thou art the man because we're so blind 
to our own failings. So it's very, very difficult to be objective about yourself. <laughs> it's very, very difficult, and I'll say that as someone who at times has trouble seeing, uh, seeing myself for who I actually am. I'm loud. I'm kind of annoying. Um, I get on my wife's nerves. I know that for sure. Um, at times, I can be... I can rage a little too much. I definitely have anger problems. But you look at that stuff, and it's real hard to turn a mirror on yourself and say, who are you really? And when you're far, far away from God, it's even harder to turn that mirror on yourself, so much so that David was like... Everything must be fine. In fact, this sermon that Nathan's preaching, it must be about someone else. <laughs> it has to be about anybody else but me. But he found out he was a worker of iniquity. Verse 6, Thou shalt destroy them that speak with speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Now, verse 6 talks about lying again, the leasing. Speaking falsehoods, and specifically speaking falsehoods that lead to carnage that lead to blood, God says that he'll destroy them. That must have been pretty hard for David to swallow. If he hadn't wrote this before his sin with Bathsheba, and he wrote it after, this must be a pretty pretty difficult pen to swallow because he was both a liar and he was bloody in doing it. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy mountain. Now, in verse 7, he's talking about, he switches, he switches gears from the type of people that cannot commune with God back to the type of person who can. He says, but as for me, a very, very poignant statement. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You could even go. Uh, when someone makes these proclamations like this, you have to sit up. But as for me, I will come into thy house. I'm not going to harp on it. I think everybody knows it. But when we're here, it's important, if at all possible, to be here. There's always extenuating circumstances. I am not going to bash extenuating circumstances. The Lord put extenuating circumstances in the Scripture. But don't kid yourself <laughs> and think that all the extenuating circumstances that you can come up with are worth missing a trip to the house of God. Right. If you're out of town, I understand. If you're sick, I understand. If you've got an, a, a previous obligation that literally cannot be gotten around, I understand. When you're just laying out because you don't want to be here, I can't bide that. Simple fact. I, the type of person that can have the relationship with God, I will come into thy house. What? With the multitude of... Of thy mercy. Why does he need mercy? Because there's a colon there. The next thing that's going to follow directly talks about the previous statement. And in fear, I will worship toward thy holy mountain. You know why it's easy and easy, easy for us sometimes to miss church? It's because we're not scared about what will happen if we do. So I will worship in fear. You know what fear is? Fear is, according to, uh, I believe, the Proverbs, the beginning of all knowledge. It is, it is a f fearing God as the foundational creator of the universe is the basis for all other knowledge, for all other wisdom that can be gained. It is, it is literally a core belief, and because. I think this is this is a nation and probably worldwide problem because we've removed that fear and chucked it in Kentucky Lake. We have a lot of ignorant people running around. We have a lot of people that
have no that 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 have built their whole lives on sand. Why why do you have people that every time something ha- bad happens they burn a city down, or uh, why why do you have why do you have uh, issues where where people have illogical that make illogical inferences based on very limited knowledge because they don't have any foundational truth. They they don't they don't un- they perceive the world outside of their control and it is but beca- because they don't acknowledge the one that's in control they seek to grab it back i will wrest control of myself and who's at fault officers are at fault sometimes people uh, sometimes i think we're even guilty of putting politicians at fault no it's no nobody this is all designed this is all the great plan of our great creator, and we don't need to fear because we, we fear. Our fear is placed in the one that actually is the one to be scared of, the one that can destroy your never-dying soul should he choose. A foundational fear. It says he will worship. What do we come here to do? Come here to worship. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Now, David has a simple request here. Just show your path to me. Sometimes, when it comes to the service of God, I think we get so overzealous that we can't see the spiritual forest for the spiritual trees. And it's not because we're not trying. It's because we're trying to do too much. <laughs> we're, 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 we, we, ha- we have no... We, we have got... We, we're zealous. And being zealous is a good thing. But zealous with no direction will just lead you wandering or leave you wandering around. And David says, I want to be led. Show me a path. Make me a path. But Larry talked about the crossing of the Jordan today and the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, you could even say Elisha's crossing of the same Jordan River. Make me a path. Open me a way. When there's no other way around, open me a way and I will follow a straight path. Open me a straight path. Uh, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sec- sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own uh, counsels. Cast them into the... Into, out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. Let all those who... uh, So in verses uh, 9 and 10, he's talking about these same people that I think he was referring to in the early part of the chapter, but he, he says... Let them fall by their own counsels. All these people out here with their with their opinions about all the political stuff going on, they will fall by their own counsel. They have to. Saying that sodomy is okay and that it is a perfectly legitimate lifestyle to live in is not a counsel that you can abide by. At the very least, your physical the physical ailments that come from that level of sin will rule you out one day. Taking God completely out of the picture that will be a ending for you. The people that say that it's okay to kill babies in the womb, that, that is going to bear itself out one day. That counsel, we, we don't have to rage against it. Now, should we, should we proclaim the gospel of our God and, and in so doing adjure these people of uh, of of their ways. Yes, we should be presenting God in His fullness, in His in His perfection, and in His love. But we we don't need to riot. We don't need to protest. We don't need to throw signs up. We don't need to go and and and, and spend eight hours on Capitol Hill every day yelling at a politician walking out to get him a ham sandwich for lunch. Because their own counsel will be their downfall. Let them think up whatever they want to think up because they come from reprobate. What are the types of minds they come from? There's no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness, and their throat is an open sepulcher. So basically everybody on Capitol Hill, that's a real good description of them. (laughs) And honestly, a lot of the people we see around us today. 
we're going to talk about open sepulchers, just flip on your TV. <laughs> never, never has a coffin been opened that stank quite so much. And why will God destroy them? End of verse 10, for they have rebelled against thee. How do they rebel? Brother Adam, they don't, they don't know what they're doing wrong. Nobody's ever told them. Untrue. Untrue. This is the thing. When Adam and Eve sinned, we gain knowledge of what two things? What, what two things did that tree give us? I'm going to go ahead and get a hand for this because I hope somebody knows. Brother Jarrett, knowledge of good and evil. And that was gifted to every one of their race. You want to know why your kids, when they take something that doesn't belong to them and they try to hide it, usually in some type of comical fashion because they don't know how to hide things yet? Because they know it's wrong. Because we gave that to ourselves. We became, the devil was right. You will become like God, knowing good and evil. God did know the difference. And we didn't. That's why Adam and Eve, I think, was allowed to run around naked around the garden because they were honestly purely innocent. They were as innocent as a baby fawn on the side of the road. They 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 didn't know any better. They don't know that if you, you they didn't know if you run around naked that that was against God's law, and God was content to leave them like that, leave them just like the animals. But when they took of that fruit, we were offered. A table of contents, if you will, on how God thinks. We know what is right and what is wrong. And so when I tell you that all these people out here that are running around doing things their own way, that they've rebelled against God, they've rebelled against God because that even if they don't want to admit it, they know it. Brother Larry was mentioning about atheists and how, how it's ridiculous for an atheist to deny God if they don't believe in God because why would you deny, you know, there's a lot of circular reasoning there. Um, but the reason atheists don't want to acknowledge God, I think he did bring this up, was that if you acknowledge a creator, you acknowledge responsibility to that creator, and you then are subjugated to his law. And they know about his law because we all do. We all know it's wrong to steal. We all know it's wrong to lie. We, know, we all know it's wrong to take another person's spouse. We all know all of these things. And even there, and that's why there are laws. There are laws to make morality true. Because you can't make lost people do something they don't want to do, so we'll, we'll, we'll put you in jail if you don't want to do it. You're, you have a physical punishment to, for it. They've rebelled against God. And that's what will destroy them. Last two verses, But let those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them shout for joy because they defend it, uh, because thou defendest them. Let them, also, uh, let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Now, this one's about trust. Let all those that have put their trust in thee save people, that's you. I think I saw a, was it on the historical badges, something about when does faith occur before or after regeneration. I was not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole uh, because I'm not smart enough to address that, that, that topic. I don't know when it happens. I'm not going to try to describe salvation to you. I'm going to take you right back to the front of this class where I told you you cannot describe that moment because it's a spiritual moment. It is an indescribable moment. Trying to explain that to a lost person is trying to is like trying to explain how to put a stove together in Chinese. You're not going to be able to do it. But say, folks, that's you. The ones that trust, let uh, let all let all those that trust in thee rejoice. Let them shout for joy. Where is the happiness? Because thou, why? Because thou defendest them. Let's jump down to verse 12 real quick. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Brings to my mind that song, Under His ring, Wing, Under His Wing. Who from his love can sever? Under his wing my soul will abide, safely abide forever. 
Why do baby chicks get underneath their mama in a storm or when it's cold? Because they know where survival's at. They know where they know where comfort's at. They know where safety's at. And that yeah, and 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 that mama will defend them till her death. There was a a, a video Sarah showed me on on Facebook or something of a mama duck and she was running across the street, and she had all her little ducklings behind them, and all the little ducklings f- fell in a storm drain, and she stopped. And she looked down that storm drain after her little baby ducklings that went away. And you could see that she was upset about that, that that little duck was upset about that. Why? Because it's her job to protect. It's her job to defend. It's her job to keep those little baby ducklings safe. And we're, for lack of a better term, we're God's baby ducklings. And he's worried about your safety, and he will defend you. But what do you have to do? You can't be like the baby ducklings running behind their mama and running into a storm drain. If you go in a storm drain, you're on your own. You're on your own, people. But if we get up close, nestled into those feathers, nice and warm, that wing will come over the top. You ain't got to. You ain't got to worry about a drop of water. You ain't got to worry about staying warm. You ain't got to worry about the old possum getting into the hen house you ain't got to worry about nothing because the safety's there secure get behind the shield people it doesn't take it takes effort but it doesn't take any more effort than i think we put into a lot of things we put a lot of effort into a lot of things that don't matter (laughs) myself included if we just put that same effort into our relationship with God we would have a bulwark of safety are there any questions about Psalms chapter 5 before we dismiss brother Jarrett you had your hand up first then brother Larry we'll go to you yeah yeah they don't they don't like to believe in God. Well, even atheists, if you really get them down to it, they believe in an intelligent creator. They just don't want to acknowledge that God is that. They're willing to believe that space aliens came and seeded this planet with life before they'll believe that God did it. Because it's much, I guess it's easier to believe that an alien created it. Yeah. Well, 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 it's, well it's, it, you, don't, you don't, you're not, you, space aliens don't have a law. Space aliens do do not require things of you. Um, Larry, you had a comment. Yeah, I was just thinking about the comment you said about the ducklings. Um, I read this other thing, and it's about a prairie fire. And it could just scorch the land, and there's a couple men walking over the land. There's a prairie chicken there, and they're trying to teach it to the game. And the chicken, the little chicks went everywhere. Tim Tim Barrow, my boss, he bush hogs a pretty a field pretty close to his house there, and uh, he was bush hogging, and there was a big there was a big doe deer standing in the field, and he mowed closer. He said, "I mowed closer and closer and closer to that deer," and he said, "About I was maybe me to brother Larry over there from from the deer," and he said, "There's a there's a fawn out here somewhere." And he come up, he got off there, and there was a fawn right there, and that mama was not gonna move. She was gonna get run over with that bush hog before she was gonna she she was gonna leave that 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 fawn there by herself. Um, and then humans want to kill our own children. So uh, who who are who are the real savages? <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? I the the video ended. I don't know. <laughs> The duck, the duck. I do not know the fate of the ducks. If it, <laughs> oh boy all right any other questions or comments before we continue all right uh y'all have a good week